the first. So, <laughs> please. Thank you. Three quick comments. One on Stephen and uh, oh, transparency in over the counter derivatives markets. I think I, I'm a great fan of transparency, except when I'm not. Um, <laughs> and I've I've been convinced over the past year or two by the work of Ben Holstrom that um, uh. that uh, transparency can sometimes have a significant negative impact on liquidity in certain kinds of markets. And I think uh, we have to we have to be very careful about when we release data uh, and the kind of data that are released. And second, following up on the data point, um, uh, and Lex, I mean, I think. Lex, we had five papers presented at the general board yesterday, uh, PSRB, uh, using the EMIR data, right, that I think demonstrate very clearly and conclusively that th those data are useful, not just for academic research. I say just. I, of course, think academic research highest priority, <laughs> but not just for academic, but that, that these data can give you uh, conclusions of great policy relevance, mm. and so I, I'm I'm a little bit worried about the demoting the data. And then finally, um, on the Vitor had stressed um, synthetically rich, and then uh, Gabriel talked about um, insurers and hedging. And I spent uh, about close to an hour on the phone with a senior person in OXA uh, the other day. Um, talking about trying to learn about how synthetic leverage is used by insurers, okay? Um, and I came away somewhat reassured. I, I, I went into the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is, this is dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, let's put it this way, I, I still have to be convinced fully, yeah. but, but I, s I, I, I see your point very mm -hmm. strongly. Yeah, the problem is that there are no perfect edges. And uh, I know <laughs> of examples in the crisis of institutions that uh, have collapsed because of the edges, which work uh, in the opposite direction they expected. Uh, but okay, uh, now, I, don't, now I, I will give the floor to for answers. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just not. Yeah, so I, I, I thought that Stephen was the first to be addressed by the transparency okay. question, and then I'll give the floor to you. Yeah, Stephen. <laughs> No, to, just to uh, emphasize, I, I fully agree with the remark, Richard, is that the, the process that you're now seeing by bringing things on exchange, it is done in a very measured way. And so only very specific bonds where we have, this is under MIFID 2, where it will be first measured how many transactions are there uh, already happening, because precisely in some cases, if there's not sufficient liquidity already or not sufficient transactions already, if you then oblige transparency, it might actually kill the liquidity. So. It is, a, uh, it, it is a general trend to also bring other instruments than equity to, uh, to the lit markets, but of course always very well calibrated and fully understanding that uh, pro you know, probably uh, transparency in derivatives markets and bond markets will never get to the same level as in equity markets because typically these are about much right. smaller issuance, et cetera. And, so, and so also under the uh, incoming regulation, which bonds will be under transparency obligations will be very carefully calibrated, also taking the actual trading into account. Okay, very good. Lex, please. <coughs> yeah, first of all, to, to, to underline it, I also very much agree with uh, Richard's first, first remark. That's why I, in my intervention, said transparency, yes, to the extent possible and wise. Uh, I think you, you uh -huh. elaborated uh -huh. on that, and uh -huh. I, I fully, uh, yeah. fully agree. On the data collection, uh, I think my, my point is not that data collection uh, was to, was to uh, responding to, uh, to my, was to, is, is too expensive and we can do it in a cheaper way uh, now. My, my feeling is, uh, and even after uh, other remarks on how useful, for instance, we can now predict uh, systemic risk. We can predict the previous crisis. It doesn't tell anything about predicting the, the next cri uh, crisis. And I, s I still feel that there is, it, we, we are talking about data collection without a good connection to our ultimate objective, or, or at least the objective that is uh, mentioned, the often systemic uh, risk. I don't see the, that you can make the connection. You will ever be able to do it and you, you, use, you, you lose time in really responding to actual threats to financial 
stability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, please. Um, Much again. of the panel, panel focused on reducing leverage, uh, either through minimum haircuts or explicitly or the synthetic leverage. And clearly, leverage, as we know, can cause problems with uh, fire sales. But if the real aim is the resilience that several of you talked about, then the other theme of the panel, namely diversity, becomes potentially all the more important. And leverage, perhaps paradoxically, can be a source of that diversity uh, through relative value trades. At a minimum leverage in one place, you know, 10 times leverage on trading leverage loans is not the same as 10 times leverage on trading bunds against uh, OATs. And so how can we be sure that we don't end up inadvertently reducing the diversity? Unfortunately, I can't share the same vision of the diverse ecosystem that, that Stephen described. As I look at investors in the market today, what I see, and this is where the interaction with monetary policy unfortunately does come back in, what I see is people giving up on relative value trading, giving up on single name stock selection, putting their money into the ETF, which is the single best performing thing in the market. And part of the reason for that is also that the constraints on, on leverage, uh, which would have allowed hedge funds and others previously to do relative value trades, again, they're just not doing the same thing. They're, they're all forced into the same trade, and that trade is basically rich for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have two more, uh, at least two more. Uh, one uh, back there first, and then you here. Um, and so I, I collect now three. Uh, back there, please. The, the mic uh, there, and then you. Uh, just to respect the order of the uh, requests for the floor. Yes, please. Uh, many thanks. That's a question to uh, Lex Sobrin. I'm Olaf mm -hmm. Aiken from the um, Yes, uh, the Secretariat. Um, and this was on the comments you made on pro-cyclicality, and you mentioned you had the um, anti-pro-cyclicality um, tools. Now, I understand that um, those, of course, work, say, in the downturn of the cycle when asset prices fall. Um, but what, what, what do you do in the, um, the upswing of the cycle when asset prices rise and your margin and haircut models tell you um, that you actually should, um, should lower those margins and, and haircuts? How do you behave in a... Mm -hmm. Um, anti-cyclical way in a sense um, in a sense there and then the second question and a bit of um, self-advertisement for the work of some of my colleagues um, who've just published a, um, a working paper um, in the ECB working paper series which shows that um, client clearing is, is very important um, in Europe so, so there my question the second part of the question would be um, how do you ensure that your um, <coughs> pro-cyclicality limiting tools all the way carried through to the end user, i.e. to the client, namely when a client doesn't clear, well, some, if somebody doesn't clear directly as a CCP um, member, but as a, as, a, as a client to a member, and how do you make sure that your pro-cyclicality limiting tools actually extend all the way through to the end user rather than, stop, end user, yeah. rather than stop at the clearing member who then may behave in a very pro-cyclical way towards the client. Mm -hmm. Many thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and fin uh, to, f to finish this group of three uh, questions. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to come back to the data question very quickly that Lex and others have touched upon. I mean, for me, it's not just about collecting more data about uh, sort of uh, specific institutions. But I, when I look at the shadow banking monitor of the ESRB, the two numbers that struck me most is that we have 40 trillion uh, of shadow banking assets approximately, uh, half of which are in OFIs, other financial institutions. And uh, it's not exactly clear what these are still. Um, and second, half of those, not necessarily the same half, are in Luxembourg and in the UK. And so clearly <coughs> the, uh, uh, the uh, um, assets of uh, shadow banks are very different um, depending on where they are located, very different on what role they play in the system. And it would be very good to know more about what these assets are actually and uh, actually are and what they're actually doing. And so in a sense, I wouldn't really mind having some of, uh, of um, you find things, um, bond funds less regulated or less documented because these are harmless animals, we understand them, they're counted somehow in the shadow banking system, but for macro pro, we really want to understand what's happening with those large amounts of assets that are fairly opaque and 
basically located somewhere where they certainly don't belong in terms of the real activity. And so that would be much more interesting in terms of data, and I think there we have quite a way to go still, unfortunately, in particular if I think about who is collecting those data. They are very often still collected by national authorities, so we are still fragmented in terms of data collection in Europe, whereas this is something that the ESRB or the ECB should be doing according to standardized guidelines, according to standardized procedures, according to standardized uh, data uh, categories, etc. And we are currently just hoping that the Luxembourgers get it right or that the UKs are getting right or that whatever. I mean, uh, I'm exaggerating a bit here, but uh, here is, I think, an enormous amount of data that we still, in fact, need, not just because we want to go further and further in academic studies, but because we want to understand what are the channels in the macro system when it comes to monetary policy or asset inequality or whatever. Yes, if the financial system would not uh, get ever more and more sophisticated, we would not uh, need more and more data. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Um, so, um, oh, um, can I uh, ask uh, how many still want to ask a question? Uh, yeah. So, if it is just one, and it's uh, Thank Francesco, you. To, to I'll give you the floor to uh, then to uh, join to the three questions Thank that we already have. I wanted have. To, to, to pass a, a, a yeah. message, which in fact I, I already referred to this morning when uh, I was intervening, but was very early in, in the day. Mm -hmm. In Europe, we are using the data. It's very important to say this, not only, but we are doing a very important investment in terms of IT. This is really big numbers. We have created a technology based on DISC, which is a machine which is able to elaborate the, na the 50 million data uh, entries which we get every day. We are looking uh, at possible indicators to identify vulnerabilities. We are created an infrastructure to examine this type of thing. So it's very important that we pass the message that in Europe, these data are being used, will continue to be used. There is a very strong consensus of all the institutions to do, to do it. And mm -hmm. this is not something which is so simply planned, but this is work on which I am having one or two meetings per week. Okay, very good. So we have had questions that at least at least involve Lex and Stephen, but of course any other member of the panel uh, should feel free also to chip in and, uh, and comment on the questions that were, that were raised. But I start with you, Lex. Yeah, uh, two questions were asked to me. Let, me. let me take one of them and then see yeah. uh, what others want to say. Uh, again, on the, on the data, perhaps um, try, trying to make my point again on a slightly different, uh, <laughs> different, different, uh, different way. The financial system, even before it became more sophisticated, has always been a complex system. And on a complex system, by definition, it's impossible, literally impossible, to collect all the data yeah. that in the end drive systemic risk, drive the decisions <laughs> being taken, if only because the main data are mental data, expectations of people on which they act. So you can, whatever you do, you will never uh, get a full, uh, full picture of the state of the uh, of the financial system at any point in time. You cannot take a photograph of the financial system, let alone make a video or a movie uh, of it. So you have to select at what you at what you look, uh, and you cannot just go to collect everything that you want to collect because that's the reflex that you always see. Uh, we have missed something, so we start to collect data on that. The point is that without a conceptual framework, without a theory that links systemic risk to driving factors, uh, and interconnectedness is one, and, and uh, we have discussed that that is still missing in the, uh, in the framework. Without a clear conceptual framework, the data are silent. They t don't tell you a lot, it's just data. Uh, I agree. It's, it's, it's bits and bytes. It's not, it has no meaning. It only gets meaning within a conceptual framework in a theory where you link it to what you want to achieve and uh, the factors that are driving uh -huh. it. Yeah. 
And Second I think question. systemic risk is, is simply, mm -hmm. simply it's beyond, uh, beyond measurement. But, uh, there was a question to you on procyclicality. Yeah, procyclicality, uh, that's, that's a <coughs> more, more technical uh, yeah. question. So if, if the, the markets are in the, uh, in the uprise, uh, let's say the margins are driven not so much by the, uh, by the increase or the decrease in price, but are driven by volatility. So if you have increasing volatilities, uh, volatility, your margins uh, go up according to the, the models and of course in line with all the, all the, uh, all the regulations. Um, what we want, uh -huh. to want, want to avoid is that we have to, to sharply uh, to, to raise margins. Uh, the flip side of that is that uh, at the moment that volatility comes down, so you would reduce uh, margins, mm -hmm. that you then do not simply reduce uh, the margins all the way, but keep them a little bit higher than you would otherwise uh, do, so that if in volatility increases again, margins do not need to, uh, don't have to be increased that sharply they otherwise would have, uh, would have done. Mm. Steven, leverage, cross-cyclicality, oh, and yeah. so on, so. No, I will be, uh, many, okay. many issues were raised and I will limit it to two issues. And on the last point, on the data issue, I, I think on this point and also considering that we're at Friday late at the day, you know, I violently disagree with, uh, with Lex on this idea is that we are in the, in, in the situation where we are asking for the last little element of the financial system. Uh, we are at least for financial markets in a situation where still very fundamental questions, we cannot answer them. If you now ask me, what is the current leverage ratio of the EU hedge fund industry, I cannot give it to you. We don't have reliable data at this stage on the leverage ratio in the hedge fund industry. We are now, tr we are now getting closer to information, complete information on counterparties in the EU. Uh, and, but it's, it is, we're working hard as an authority to get the uh, quality of the data better and reliable. And so at least for financial markets, and I, I cannot judge it, I'm less able to judge it for banking and assurance, we are still in a very um, uh, starting phase of getting data. I can remember in 2008, 2009, if we as securities regulators would get together and we would have a risk discussion, we would have on the table the reports from the, from the banking sector, their own reports, the commercial banks, providing us the information on their risk analysis. So uh, on this point, I really need to uh, make the, 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 the perspective and give the perspective this is ongoing work. I know this is, it can be become a never ending story, but we're clearly not uh, in that part. Final, very little comment on the, uh, the point on the ETF, etc. Obviously, I am all for fundamental analysis by professionals, etc. I was questioning whether for an end consumer that has a couple of savings would be the most logical to go into active management. So that was the, the context of the remark. Gabriel. So very quickly on, on two subjects on, on data, I couldn't agree more what Stephen was saying. And, uh, and actually, I think the, the biggest value that we see now already, for example, in insurance is the fact that we have harmonized the data. And because like this, we can have a, you know, a, a, an idea and much better information about how the system as a whole uh, behaves in, uh, in Europe. In the past, it was very scattered in, you know, in country A or country B or country C. So the value of having this harmonization, uh, it's, 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 uh, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic. And uh, we, should, we should go in that direction. And we are definitely far from going on all the details, et cetera. But for example, on, asset, on the asset uh, uh, data, we are now, I think, in a much better position because we have harmonized that. On the, on the other point on procyclicality, and I couldn't agree more that this is something that we will need con to continue to look from a point of view of, uh, of the, the, the regimes and to try to embed in the regimes these uh, kind of anti-cyclical elements. You know. uh, what we have done, for example, in Solvency 2 on the equity side, we have already embedded in Solvency 2 what we call an equity dampener so that the, the, the risk charges on equity, they are increased when the, when the markets are really booming on an uprise and they are decreased when the markets are going down precisely to mitigate the this point of, of fire sales and to give the, the, I would say, the right incentives and to, to try to overcome uh, pro-cyclicality. So everything that we can do, I think, on the regimes, uh, um, in this case, a micro prudential regime, to deal with this element of pro-cyclicality, I think it's good from a macro, from a macro prudential perspective. Mm -hmm. Mario. Uh, 
Maybe just one word, because I must say, the more Lex talks about data, the more you get it wrong, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the point, the point is certainly not the last data, but actually, if you take the share of the data we are collecting with respect to the data we are produced, we even go down in share, because of course there is a huge amount of data that are produced, and what we are trying to extract is the trend. What we are trying to extract is exactly the harmonization that Gabriel was saying, so sorry, Relax mm. and collect data. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You, <laughs> you, please. You want to uh, add something? Yeah. Well, I have to weigh in on the data. I, I look, I commend the use of data. Maybe I, I'm more practical. I think we should sometimes be proportionate. Uh, the new uh, MIFID directive is a big bang to collect even more data, uh, whereas in the US uh, it took Trace at least eight years to be implemented. Maybe there's a, uh, a bid ask here between the pacing and proportionality so that the quality of the data can be uh, very useful for, for, uh, for policymakers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, we will stop here, but not uh, without me uh, also adding something to the data. Uh, <laughs> to the data issue, just to reinforce now the point of view of, say, uh, the economists. And uh, one of the things that is uh, uh, at stake in our discussion here is precisely non-banking and what initially was called shadow banking. And shadow banking is not a set of institutions. It's a set of activities and instruments uh, because shadow banking was done also by banks. So uh, the proper concept of shadow banking, it, it, it's, a, it's a longer story to explain and the, 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 the way it was then uh, misused. But the point is why this word shadow banking came. It came because precisely what happened before the crisis was the attempt to create private safer assets uh, in view of a huge demand for safer assets and a scarcity of uh, uh, safe assets from the official side. And uh, the attempt was done by using OTC derivatives, securitizations, and repos. These were the three instruments that created uh, inside liquidity, short-term uh, quasi-money uh, uh, instruments, and uh, all sorts of edging to uh, make safer some of the instruments that were being used. And the point is that these things are not in the statistics. After the Second World War, all countries made a big effort to have national accounts, to have flow of funds, to have monetary statistics. They don't include any of this. Let me give the example. The forms of short-term liabilities that act in the financial system as quasi-money are not in the monetary statistics, not in the monetary aggregates. The, uh, the exposures that come in the flow of funds are totally changed by the derivatives activities. So what is there in the balance sheet uh, and goes into the flow of funds in many cases means very little because the exposure has been transferred via derivatives, and we, it's not there in the flow of funds uh, numbers. Uh, and uh, also, uh, this means indeed that we need, and there is a, a very good book by uh, economists, Bruno Meyer, Gary Gorton, Krishnamurti, and many others called Risk Topography, where they demonstrate and uh, appeal to a big effort from uh, the advanced economies to go in a overall of these basic uh, apparatus of uh, macro statistics that was developed, you know, many decades ago and no longer reflects what is going on in our financial system. So I end with that uh, <laughs> appeal to last word to data to reinforce what you said, which was also very good. And thank you very much for all panelists, and we conclude here. Yeah.